Great job for us uh, across the reception this afternoon at 4 o'clock at the Pratt. Okay, so hopefully you all can join us there, um, and we'll have some wonderful refreshments and great networking going on there. Um, first of all, thank you to General Shea, Susan, the entire Tina, the entire AFSIA team for asking me to be a part of today's uh, panel. And I want to give a uh, lots of kudos, one of the best conferences I've seen in this forum in a long time. Uh, great agenda, great participation, and uh, this is a repeat for sure. We're honored to have our star-studded panel with us today. I think you'll recognize most of them. And they asked us to talk about women in cyber. And this morning when we met, we concluded we are women in cyber. So we meet that criteria. Uh, it also says in there what keeps us awake at night. And so you'll see some, hear some perspectives and discussions along that way. And there's very little to keep me awake at night when I think about women in cyber. And I look at all the great work, uh, the nonprofits, the connections that are going on today. I'm blessed to be associated with Girls, Inc., who uh, we work with them to talk about the importance of STEM degrees, staying in school, uh, and how important that is. And one of our winning stories is a young lady by the name of Bianca Bailey, who was growing up in Texas at a very young age, unfortunately, she saw her mother shot and killed, and the father couldn't handle it. They became homeless. She ended up being put in a home, and a woman leader in Exxon put her arms around Bianca and said, you need to join Girls, Inc. You need to think about staying in school. You need to think about a degree in science, technology, engineering, and math. And she did. She graduated from Howard University with a chemical engineer degree. And last year was recognized in the White House uh, as a leading woman in STEM. And so it is important. And as we look about women in cyber, how we bring them forward, there is all based in the pool of availability. And we got to build that, that base to get the right leaders in, in STEM. I'm also on the board of advisors for the president of Dakota State University, who is shifting the entire curriculum to cyber and STEM. In fact, just recently was certified by NSA and FBI to stand up three skips so that we can graduate students not only in these needed degrees, but with their clearances so that they can go to work right away. And that's what's going to be so critical to us. And uh, so it's reaching out, finding programs like that that will make us successful as we go forward in the future. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first panel uh, speaker. Uh, you all know her, General Sarah Zabel, who I have had the privilege of uh, working with over the last couple of years. Very impressed by her vision, her strategy, her openness. And when I thought about one of the questions that was asked at lunch, you know, what is preventing this relationship maybe between the government and industry. And I'm not going to say trust when I work with people like General Zabel and her understanding of that. I am very excited that, uh, not that she's leaving DISA, that, that is not good, but what the Air Force is understanding is how important we uh, acquire IT and cyber. And she's going to become the director of IT acquisition processes. And I know without a doubt we've been working this for years General Zabel is going to get us there and work us through that. So with that, please welcome General Zabel. Yeah, I guess that is on. Thank you, General Lawrence. I really appreciate it. Uh, you guys are actually kind of lucky. Um, the, the lady who set this panel up told me, we were standing in the back of the room, she said her goal was standing room only. So if we didn't get enough people, you just the commanders in that front row, I was going to say, stand up. <laughs> but you get to sit. So I appreciate that. Anyway, it is good to see all you guys. Uh, they gave us an interesting challenge. So the, uh, as General Lawrence said, what we're 
what the, the teaser is uh, across this, uh, this panel is what keeps our senior leaders up at night? And they offered us some, you know, there's another flyer that had, has some, some ideas, some suggestions, like critical infrastructure protection, uh, risk, you know, risk management, resilience of systems, um, and uh, other things like protection of personal information. And absolutely, yes, when you think about all those things, that is kind of the broad category, it's, those are examples within the broad category of what, what keeps me up at night. And really what it gets to is a loss of boundaries. Um, I think that's especially problematic for a military organization, for a defense organization, because we were born, our traditions, our pr traditions assume that there are boundaries. Uh, you know, back at, long ago, there, when there were massive land armies and that's how wars were fought, if uh, an army's coming at you, you know, there they are, see them, and they're coming at you, and so you could, you could fight them, you could defend. But now that got eaten away. Our borders got eaten away with, uh, well, aircraft, ballistic missiles, the other things that um, made it so that you could not necessarily feel like you're going to immediately see the in enemy coming and be able to respond. And it's even so much more so in the world of cyber. So now our, the loss of boundaries, it includes what is it that we're defending? So... Um, when you consider uh, what is it that, that we think is important, certainly classified systems, um, military operational, operational systems, those are important. But our adversaries, they've reached out and they have attacked others. They've uh, uh, you know, attacked logistics systems. We were talking briefly about Transcom. And um, I, our luncheon speaker mentioned it as well, how our commercial partners are attacked, their information stolen, and by the way, their information is our information, where we've asked them to logistically, you know, move um, material around. Uh, our personal information is, is stolen, uh, such as the, the OPM brief, breach. And uh, if you consider that if uh, the Yahoo uh, identity theft, uh, you know, theft of information was attributed to the, the Russian, you know, the, the Russian state, then presumably they're also feeling that they get some sort of uh, national advantage and presumably our national disadvantage from taking information that is uh, about a whole lot of people, some will be military, some will not, um, from a purely civilian organization. So we are, we've lost any sense of, of boundary. And it's not just so the information and the systems that we need to protect, but also you know, how do you protect them? And what comes to mind is uh, like critical infrastructure. If a power plant goes offline and it could be miles away from a base, but it might be a result of that power plant going off that the aircraft can't launch, that we can't see uh, some sort of incoming attack. So critical infrastructure, even if it's you know, civilian critical infrastructure, now suddenly that's part of the um, area that we need to defend. Uh, supply chain risk management. So go back in time. Go back in time when software was developed for, for the software supply chain. Go back in time for when a uh, hardware system was put together and shipped, you know, hopefully without its part being, parts being substituted, um, and put into use in some sort of um, application. So we no longer have a a good, clear sense of here's what we protect, here's how we protect it. Instead, we, uh, we see a continuing change in what our adversary is doing, and we try to um, rapidly respond to it. Uh, something that the military is not well positioned to do <laughs> is make a uh, rapid response. Um, I'm sorry, changes, rapid changes to our, um, our existing plant. Um, we, in DISA, we control a massive worldwide network, and the... The, you've heard the director's priorities, the district director's priorities yesterday, when one of the things he talked, he talked about, you know, what he wants to do. He wants to innovate and change how we do identity, you know, how we keep track of identity in order to better protect our information. He wants to change to, uh, he wants to go mobile. He wants to uh, go to a, a gray core, a gray network, instead of our, you know, massive worldwide network. Absolutely um, necessary. These are the sorts of innovations that we need in this sort of world. But how hard to do that when you are um, operating a, uh, a huge, large, uh, you know, e existing infrastructure, and you've got to keep on operating that infrastructure while you're making the change. Now, one of the long-term effects of the world that we live in right now is we are 
attuning so much of our t attention to the cyber threat. And I mean, this, this entire conference, the Defense of Cyber Operations a co a Symposium, sorry, we don't say conference anymore. <laughs> it's a symposium. <laughs> See, we are agile in that at least. Um, <laughs> You know, to it really emphasizing defensive cyber. And so what it feels like we're starting to lack is the benefits that we get and we need to get from continuing to automate our operational processes, from continuing to innovate in the mission space. From uh, In the military, we have a thing, a, a process we call Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. And that is a, we call it the OODA loop. And the idea is that we need to do that very quickly. We need to observe, orient, you know, decide what we're going to do and take the action and carry it through. We need to do that very fast while we make our, our enemies, our adversaries, you know, we, we make it hard for them to do that. So if you consider, you know, what sort of information systems do we have that we could actually be getting a great military national advantage out of? And what is the creative process for making those things happen? And then you look at how much we're weighted down by a, uh, now, the feeling that, okay, the adversary's coming from just anywhere. You know, like I said, there, is, there are no boundaries anymore. The adversary's coming from anywhere, and we need to defend. You know, we're on the defensive, on the defensive, just no time to think about doing the job better, um, being more imaginative, bringing new capabilities to our war fighters, bringing new capabilities to our national leaders so that they can observe and orient and think and make decisions and act much faster. That seems to be kind of lost under the requirement to, to keep on you know, responding, you know, get back, hunker back, and keep on responding to a cyber threat. So what does it take to, uh, to deal with a new world where the boundaries that we're used to just simply don't exist anymore. We can be affected in our personal lives. Um, we can be affected as a military organization far, far from any base, um, far, far from any um, sense of action by players, by entities that we don't necessarily think of as a military threat, and yet, and yet they are. Um, we also are in a position where we need to um, bring new capabilities. We need to be technologically innovative. Um, we need to be able to give our, uh, our, our, our partners, our mission partners, uh, new capabilities, new ways of getting their jobs done that really transcend what we're able to do now. And yet we're, we're trapped under this weight of uh, having to keep, you know, we're hunkering down and, and responding to the enemy. Uh, I think that what we need is we need more agility than we've been able to show. Uh, we need to bring in um, new ideas, uh, you know, reach wider, uh, reach out farther to our own uh, membership, our own, uh, you know, industry partners to bring in new capabilities, new thoughts. Uh, apparently, our enemies are able to innovate very fast in new ways to, uh, to, to try to take advantage of us. So we need to innovate even faster, and we need to transcend our boundaries um, because, frankly, like I said, the boundaries don't exist anymore. So if you think about, okay, what keeps you up at night, uh, that's kind of the, the long rambling spiel of the fact that we, we have to constantly respond to the adversary. We don't know where they're coming from next. Um, of course, they're going to attack us in our weakest spot. That's, you know, that's what they do. But also the loss of opportunity, the loss of the, uh, the chance to do things better, to take our craft and put it to the use of our uh, mission partners and, um, and our leadership, that loss of that opportunity, that is what, what disturbs me. And I'm hoping in the next job I go to that I'll have a chance to, to deal with both of those factors, with uh, how do we get more agile and innovative in, in, in IT, um, and how do we uh, deal with the fact that the, constantly deal with the fact that the world's changing rapidly and it's going to keep on changing? So, anyway, I guess that's what <laughs> keeps me up at night. I hope I hope I will uh, give you some of you uh, nightmares as well. Thank you. No, the rule, that was very good. Thank you. You know, the rules of engagement when we complete here is that. You either ask us questions or we get to ask you questions. And I'm, I've already started on the list as I know so many of you out there. Um, our next uh, guest speaker is no stranger to many of you that are here today. Ms. Bobby Stempley uh, is currently with the MITRE Corporation. 
but served with, uh, I guess you've left already, actually, but uh, served in DISA from 1997 to 2010. And when you think about periods, decades of big change, that's probably that decade. When you think about transitioning from the Cold War to 9-11 into two major combat operations and having to provide the networks connectivities and the security of our information during that time, Bobby was engaged and in the middle of that. She also served five years in Defense uh, Homeland Security and Department of Homeland Security uh, with that. So she's been at all of the kind of the pressure points. So there were a number of things that kept Bobby awake at night as she went through this. But her new assignment, which we're excited about, is as the managing director of CERT for Carnegie Mellon and bringing in that aspect of the Defense Department from commercial to academia is very important. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bobby. Um, I, I have to say, I hate the question, what keeps you up at night, right? Because it's very temporal. Um, and, uh, and, and as a question, my answer is very similar to yours, right? The, the ability, it's great, it's great. Um, the ability to have agility in operations when you actually don't know what your operational landscape is in any given moment, who your partners are going to be, what threat you're fighting um, in that moment, and what success looks like. And success is uh, not longstanding. Um, that's the space, right? That, that's effectively the space we're in. And so the ability to be agile in that kind of a, an environment is really difficult because you don't, you don't know who your partners are. You don't know how to build trust. You never want to meet somebody in the middle of the event. You want to get to know them before the event, and that's, that's not always possible. So I've been spending a lot of time in the last several years uh, reflecting on what got us to this point and trying to figure out what are the next set of challenges we might face so that we can learn from the past. And, and been on the receiving end uh, for the last at least decade across my time in DOD, in DHS, at MITRE, the receiving end of a bunch of criticisms, right? We've done it wrong, it's not good enough, you don't have the capacity to do it. Why should we believe this, comp this compromise occurred, so why should we trust you to have more of our data? And, and I've, I've, come to the, I've come to the opinion that we're on the right path. Right? If I think about how the nation is solving this problem, I'm not going to speak about efficacy or speed. Those are things we really need to face. But if I think about how the nation is solving this problem, we are engaged in norm behavior conversations. Right? We are working internationally to say, this is what is allowed on the network. And these are the kinds of things we're going to do to hold you accountable, you nation state actor, you non-nation state actor. That was a game changer for us to really understand as a nation how we needed to handle engagement with non-nation state actors. And we're doing it not just in the cyber dimension, but more broadly. But it was a game changer for us. Here's how you need to behave. Here's the capacity we need to grow domestically and internationally. And here's how we need to engage to build capacity in other countries that will help us domestically um, in that landscape. Um, we need to build capacity and switch this from an engineering problem to an outcome-oriented problem. Um, I, I, uh, I had the privilege in 1999, a very long time ago, uh, to stand up the first defense-wide cert. The Air Force had theirs. It was great. It was phenomenal. But we didn't have one at the defense-wide level. Um, and that was an organization of technicians, and we did good work. And then we realized as a department that we needed a military command structure in place. And it has been a real interesting journey, I think, um, since, uh, since the early 2000s to watch the evolution of joint task forces, joint force headquarters, combatant com subcomponent, combatant commands uh, growing forward, and an engagement domestically with how that fits into our intel portfolios and our homeland security portfolios. But you see them making this switch now to what's the outcome? How do I need to think about that outcome? A real focus on building internal capabilities and security in the environment across the federal government. So here's the test question for the folks in the room. How many departments and agencies exist in your federal, federal government? 
Uh, it's about 115, um, and that number changes by executive order, so it can be different. Um, and they range in size from the size of the Defense Department, Department of State, Department of Veteran Affairs to six people. You have a slightly different IT problem in that kind of dimension, a slightly different budget. They're called micro departments. Don't look so skeptical. They really exist. Um, uh, but, they, uh, but you have a different IT problem in that landscape that you have to handle. It doesn't mean the information that those six people are processing is l any less important but it's a very different scale for you to manage. Uh, growth in workforce, right? We have to grow workforce in this environment. Alignment of our engagement with critical infrastructure, right? Alignment of regulatory, non-regulatory engagement. What does this look like? So the government as a whole can engage in an effective way with critical infrastructure and not in a, oh, Knock, 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 I'm from the DOD. Knock, 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 I'm from DHS. Knock, 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 I'm from your regulatory agency, uh, other uh, activities. We need to exercise and practice. We've been doing a lot of those. Next week, actually, Cyber Endeavor, Cyber Flag um, exercises, really significant national level exercises. And the other thing that we've just started appreciating, I think, is that we've made the best decisions we can without really understanding the science behind the problem. And so we're, if you look at it now, we've got a big push about growing the science behind the problem. Not just the computing science, that is huge, um, but the cognitive science, the political science, the other components, the economics behind it. Because it isn't just do the right hygiene work. You have to absolutely do that. But that doesn't get you across the finish line. Right? That doesn't affect what, how adversaries think. That doesn't affect the, the scope of this wicked, wicked problem. And so the real question, I think, for us for the next five years is how do we think about those tools, right? The capacity in Cyber Command, the capacity in DHS, the capacity in our, our private sector uh, partners. How do we take those tools and apply them to what I see as four additional game-changing things, right? AI and machine learning. It's gonna be as much a benefit for us as it is a benefit for them. What does that need to look like? How do we think about that in this space? How does that overlap with anonymity and with, uh, with our, our ethos, which is we need to think before we fire? And if you are going to take an action that has dramatic effect, there needs to be human thinking applied to that. Uh, advanced manufacturing, right? We are, we are just in time logistics. We are just in time printing components all over the world. What is that going to look like from a cyber dimension? Autonomy. Right? Enabled, obviously, both by advanced manufacturing and AI. But again, real hit hits with, in, with identity, real issues with other components. And how we do a better job with human-machine interaction. And that's not just human-machine teaming, right? That's how we sort of shorthand it when we talk about the third offset and other mechanisms. But this is about human-machine interaction in computing, biological computing, in, uh, embedded, embedded capabilities. This is, these, these are the emerging trends going forward that, is, that are transforming our war fighting. They're transforming our civilian apparatus. They're transforming our economy. These are the challenges I think we need to, we need to move our mind to. Bobby has a wonderful grasp from all facets, uh, from the industry, com uh, government, and now academia to, to go after these challenges. So we're looking forward to hearing from her in the future. Our next guest speaker uh, is someone I just met and very impressed with. Dr. Diana Burley uh, is the executive director and chair of the Institute of Information Infrastructure Protection. She's also a full professor of, of human and organizational learning at George Washington University uh, in that assignment. She's published over 75 times. When I think about what keeps her up at night is the time that she went to the Hill and testified 
multiple times is always a challenge as she goes uh, through that piece of it. Um, what I am really excited about is she is working on the committee that is, is uh, defining the curriculum of, for cyber across our academic institutions. Because, and this was something we just recently talked about at our executive committee. When you talk cyber, you talk, it depends who you're talking to and how they define it. But when we think about teaching it and, and building this core of future cyber experts, what is their curriculum and what is the common ground there? And so uh, she has taken on a huge challenge, one that is very needed. Additionally, um, I've asked her to meet with you, General Shea, on some of these discussions. As we talk about the role of AFSEA, uh, bringing the government and industry and academia together, uh, I look forward to working with Dr. Burley in the future and the things that she's doing with that. So thank you again for being here for us today. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here with you and to talk with you about uh, some of the issues that, uh, that keep us all up at night. I think when, when that question came to me, um, you know, I would like to define it in a way that says that you know, right now, whenever you read about cybersecurity and you read about the human elements and cybersecurity workforce and people talk about uh, people and humans being the weakest link, what keeps me up at night is, is working on how we can transform the notion of people as the weakest link to recognizing that people are actually our strongest, um, strongest objective, strongest uh, uh, piece of this chain. And so much of my work and, and much of my work over the last probably 15 or 20 years has been focused on doing that, on developing the human aspects of the cybersecurity workforce and thinking very critically about how we do that. Uh, in the course of that, and what I'll talk to you about today is the work um, that, I'm, that I'm leading on behalf of the Association for Computing Machinery, the ACM. For those of you who are not familiar with the ACM, it's the largest computing society in the world with over 100,000 members, uh, most of which are located outside of the U.S. And importantly, the ACM is the body behind much of the curriculum that you look at when you look at standard curricula in cyber, in, excuse me, in computer science or computer engineering or software engineering. When you see these programs and you know that you can go to any institution around the country or really around the world that has a computer science degree program and feel fairly confident about what you're going to get if you go to that program and they have some kind of accreditation, it's because they have followed the development of their programs, have followed the guidelines that have been developed by the ACM. And so about a year and a half ago, in, uh, in, in mid-2015, the ACM decided to stand up a new joint task force to look specifically at developing cybersecurity curricular guidelines. And I was asked to co-lead this task force with my colleague, Matt Bishop, who's out of the UC, uh, UC Davis um, campus. And what our charge is, is to develop curricular guidance that would help institutions, whatever their size, whatever their focus, whether they're based in the U.S. or not, but to help them develop cybersecurity degree programs at a variety of different levels and across a variety of different disciplines. Because as we recognize, the cybersecurity workforce of the future is not coming straight out of computer science. They're coming out of many different disciplines, be they computing-based disciplines or even non-computing-based disciplines, so sociology, uh, anthropology, even our lawyers need to have some, site, some type of cybersecurity understanding as we move forward in society. And so our charge has been to develop these curricular guidelines to enable programs and institutions around the world to develop programs such that there is some level of consistency so that when you go to these institutions and you're looking for people who will join your workforce as 
uh, members of your cybersecurity team that you can feel fairly confident about the, the content of their knowledge, both in terms of what they know, but also hands-on. What are they able to do? Because we recognize that it's not just about book knowledge, but it's also about being able to, to straddle that line and, and to understand what they're doing and at the same time be able to demonstrate that with hands on the keyboards. Uh, and so we're looking at both of those issues. Now, as I'm learning more about FCA and I'm understanding that it's really about linking the government and, and industry and academia, I want to say to you that as we have, as we have developed or are in the process of developing these curricular guidelines, we are following much of that same tact in terms of making sure that we have all players at the table and a part of, of what we're doing. As a part of our task force work, we have stood up an, an industry advisory board. We have regular communication and liaisoning with the members of the federal government here in the U.S. who are working uh, on the NICE initiative, for example, uh, who are working in the National Science Foundation and DHS to develop cybersecurity uh, workforce programs. But we're also working with other entities around the world who are doing the same thing. I had the opportunity to, to go to Singapore last summer with the State Department to do some cybersecurity awareness training and interacted with uh, the Singapore Cybersecurity Agency and have them involved in, in working with us to develop this. And, and most recently was in Dubai just a, a couple of weeks ago and had an opportunity, again, to work with some of their folks there in developing a, a cybersecurity curricular guidance document that will, that will not just be adopted in the U.S., but that will be adopted around the world. It's not just about the specific requirements, but it's also about being culturally sensitive. As we, as we listen to the panel and, and talk about the lack of borders, uh, those lack of borders also exist when we're talking about developing the workforce. Not only do we have um, multinational corporations, but we also have to recognize the fact that we have intergovernmental work and we have a connected world system where we need to have a workforce that understands that there are cultural dynamics at play that have serious implications for the way that they do their work regardless of where they're working within the cybersecurity workforce. And so what we're trying to do is to incorporate that kind of guidance so that as institutions are looking to develop their programs, they can be sensitive to um, the needs of, of various sectors, but also the needs of various cultures and recognizing that all of those things uh, play a role in the work that they're doing and the work that they will be doing. Uh, and so that has to be incorporated into the academic environment. It is quite challenging to get academic institutions. Uh, for those of you who have worked with or, or for them, you know that, that we can often be very narrow in our attention span, just in terms of really focusing on what the academic needs are and not necessarily, at least not at the outset, paying a significant amount of attention to the needs of, of the workforce, of the workplace. Uh, and so traditionally, as academic institutions develop curriculum and develop programs, they do that um, in a very insular manner. They may have an industry advisor or some sort who will come in and look at things at the end, but not really involved in, in the totality of the process. And so we have taken a different tact with our work where we have engaged with industry and government and all of the different stakeholders who are intimately involved with, who are members of our task force, who are intimately involved with the development of our process and the development of our guidelines from the beginning because we recognize that what we are doing in the space that we are, are working in is really not just about cybersecurity, but it also uh, is an exemplar for the way that higher ed needs to change and adapt for the, the uh, environment that we are in now. So if you are at all interested in helping to shape this curriculum and helping to develop um, what these guidelines look like and how they will be implemented, please be in touch with me. Uh, I will tell you that we also have a website. Our website is CSEC, as in cybersecurity, CSEC2017, all pushed together, .org. And you can go to that website. You can certainly get my contact information there and also get all of the information about the task force, our history, how we stood up. Um, we, have, uh, we also have draft documents that are posted on the website. 
Uh, on Monday, just, just two days ago, we released our latest draft, our second draft of the curricular guidance, and so it is up for public review and comment and will be open through the 3rd of July. At that point, we will, we will begin to hunker back down and continue the development process um, behind the scenes, but you can always uh, provide guidance, um, get feedback, get briefings, et cetera. And so we're really working hard to make sure that when we release the final version, which will come in December of this year, that we are able to rapidly implement and that we have um, a document that has not just been developed and vetted by academic institutions of varying sizes, but one that has been developed and vetted by, um, by government, military, uh, business, large, small, medium, across different sectors, across different cultures, and in different jurisdictional environments. That's, that's a, a critical part of what we're doing. It can be very difficult to, to kind of navigate the, the academic lanes and, and, you know, we get very tied down to what type of institution we are or whether we are doing training or education or what all of that means and, and we're really trying to strip those barriers away and, and ignore those boundaries and come together uh, as, as a community of stakeholders who care very much about how we can take this, this challenge, this ever-present challenge that, depending on what report you read, continues to grow by the day uh, in terms of what the needs are and turn it into a, a strength. I will also say, just as, as one final remark, that we tend to think very broadly about what the cybersecurity workforce means. Um, we, can, we can get narrow and we can focus very specifically on, on what some of us call the tip of the spear, those folks who are working in op centers. but. To think more broadly, I think, serves us better as a society because as we look across all of the different positions and jobs that people do, whether we technically or consider them today as members of the cybersecurity workforce, they will be members of that workforce in the future. If we look at our medical professionals, um, just to, just to, to pull one group out of, out of the air, we find that there are components of their jobs that are increasingly related to how they can ensure the security and, and um, efficacy of their systems and their data. And so the tack that we are taking is to provide guidance that will both allow and support individuals who want to develop full academic programs, but also help those individuals who want to design and develop components that would fit in other types of programs to ensure that we're able to raise the entirety of society uh, who will be operating in this environment regardless of the particular place that, that they will be doing that work. So with that, I will turn it back over to you, Jenna. Wow. Please. Join me in, in, in thanking these young ladies from their perspectives of where they are and fabulous leaders in each field. Thank you. So what, what is your first question for this panel? Yes, ma'am. There's a microphone right here. Thank you. Hello. Hello. This is a three-part question for uh, General Zybo. Okay. Hi, ma'am. Hi. <laughs> I'm Jeanetta Garrett with uh, this is CIO Office Directorate, and my question is: One, okay, what role as a woman in cyber do you see women in cyber playing? And two, do you have a strategy or uh, plan to get a more diverse group of women involved in cyber with DISA? And three, if so, what is it? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of important roles. So, of course, as you heard us talk, you walked into a women in cyber panel, and we I don't think we brought up any women's issues um, because we are, of course, professionals who are doing our job, and um, we're also women. Um, but I do think it is an important role. Uh, I mean, one of the roles that we have as leaders is to be visible. Um, 
We have, I, I, I've heard many times, and I, I do believe that for young people, when they look up and they don't see anybody who looks like them in some sort of uh, position, whether it's military or leadership of a company or, or anything, you know, um, showing up at a, a sports team, they, they don't see people who look like them, they tend to um, not engage. They tend to stop showing up. So being, I think one of the important roles that we have is to, to be here, be visible, and, but to be, you know, professionals is to the, you know, to be good role models. So um, that is one thing we want to do. Uh, now, you talked about a strategy for diversity. And that's a really, that's a really complex problem. Of course, uh, diversity, there are very physically visible aspects of diversity, such as male, female, different races, um, different, you know, military, civilian. Uh, there's, there's different ways where you can look at a person and uh, say that, okay, this one is clearly, that one is clearly not like that one. But one of the most important areas that we're still um, needing to, to explore more is how do we get actual diversity of experience, diversity of thought? Because if we're going to be able to tackle brand new problems that come out, you know, just completely unthought of yesterday and yet today it is, it's a big problem, we need to be able to approach it in a, um, you know, you, you just don't know which, uh, what, what the approach is that's going to, um, to win. And when you have a diverse workforce, that's when you have the, the best opportunity to bring in that new idea so that you can have a winning, uh, winning solution. Now, the strategy for diversity, how do we achieve it? Um, we are actively reaching out to target specific, you know, diverse groups. So uh, going out to, uh, um, to academic institutions and not only uh, a diverse set of academic institutions from uh, socioeconomic um, status, um, different parts of the country, um, but also making sure that we're, we're talking to, you know, opening the doors to the widest variety of people that we can get in there. So that's one of the areas where, you know, we have a, a, a strategy to go out and to, to talk to different people. Um, another one is to uh, intentionally um, celebrate the diversity that we already have and hoping that that will help our, you know, the, mem the diversity, the, the members of that organization, you know, be visible and, again, be role models. We've uh, recently reactivated, uh, reinvigorated our uh, employee resource groups, uh, ERGs, which we have in DISA. We've had for quite a, quite a while, but they were kind of uh, not very visible, um, and we're, we're pushing them out to be more visible, more active, just so people can see here are, you know, people like me. So whether um, Hispanic, female, LGBT, um, uh, Asian American, uh, just all these different groups, we want them to be out there, be visible, and, you know, have people see that, look, there's, you know, different types of people there. So it's a matter of reaching out to a crowd, to crowds that we haven't reached out to before, but also making the diversity that exists in, in DISA more visible so that people can look at DISA and say, okay, well, maybe I do belong there. Yeah, great. Bobby, any perspective? Yeah, uh, so I'm going to uh, launch from the DISA comment into, into I think, a broader, uh, a broader perspective. <coughs> Excuse me. There are... There are a couple of things I think we have to really think about in the cyber dimension that are somewhat unique um, in this space. We think about our adversary, right, early, way back when our adversary was a teenage boy in a hoodie. We talk in a very military, we are in the Defense Department, it's appropriate in this context to talk in a very militaristic context between adversaries and others. These are inherently off-putting to some people who are not used to this culture and have been a reason why women have not come in, right? So we have to be open to more diverse understandings of what's possible and different language in communicating what these, uh, what these kind of uh, challenges are um, in this space. Because we need not only to think about diversity from the prospect of the very physical representations of it, but we also need to not get stuck in the, the only successful cyber individual is someone who can reverse engineer malware at 2 o'clock in the morning and can uh, and drinks red uh, code red and uh, can't communicate with humans. Right, that is, a, that is a not good place for us to be. To Diana's point, we have to have individuals across the dimension being able to do that. We need those people, and there are not enough of them. 
I acknowledge, agree. But we need incredibly smart attorneys who understand the technology and enable the kinds of outcomes we need. We need cognitive scientists and psychologists and other, uh, other individuals as well. Diana, do you have any thoughts on that? I would just say that we need to, to spend a bit more time um, focusing on debunking the myth and the stereotype of what a cybersecurity professional is. When we don't have that true understanding, and, and I don't mean the people in this room, but the people who are out in society, if you think about who really influences the children and what the children decide that they want to become, there are really two groups. It's parents and teachers. And so we really have to make sure that the teachers understand what it really means to be a cybersecurity professional, because it means a lot of different things. But if the teachers don't know that and don't understand that, they can't begin to open the eyes and, and the curiosity of the students when they're young, I mean, we, we spend a great deal of time putting together camps and clubs that will introduce our young people into to this profession. But if we don't spend time helping those who would influence the children to go into those camps and clubs, helping them to understand what the profession is, we're not going to get a diverse set of kids moving into the field and then moving up and, and through. And so we have to recognize that we have to do a better job at, at really helping people understand what, what it means to be in this professional space. Thank you. Ashley. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm really fascinated by your, your career journeys um, from changing different organizations and rising forward. Could you talk a little bit about that and maybe share some tips with the room of how they can accelerate their career? Um, General Zabel and I wore the same uniform for a long time. So, Bobby, you went from, from government to industry to now academia. Uh, what motivated you to, to first change, which is scary, and to go into completely different fields? Uh, wow. Um, so interestingly enough, um, the hardest career decision I made was leaving DISA. Um, I, I spent a really long time in the agency, worked for a number of directors, and had phenomenal opportunities. I started as a GS-12 uh, and left as the CIO. Um, and so just in terms of, of that span. Um, but, but two things I think I would say have repeated themselves every time I've had to make a decision or I've taken the opportunity to make a decision um, to move. Uh, the first one is, um, is really one of making sure that I was in a place where I wasn't in my comfort zone. Right, it's very easy uh, for for me. I mean, I was the, for a long time in my life. I was the single income earner. I had three kids. I'm thinking about college. Right, um, it was easy to be secure um, and and to be in that place. And so, honestly, trying to find an opportunity that required stretch, um, or at least acknowledging that I had rested, I was in a, a secure place, and maybe when that opportunity came, because I I've, I have to say. At least for the last several jobs, I haven't done a lot of looking. Opportunities have sort of, when I said maybe I'm open to it, opportunities have appeared um, in that space. So I think that's the first one is don't let yourself get too comfortable uh, where you are. And the second one is don't spend too much time looking for the right answer. You know, avoid the wrong answer at, at all costs. Avoid the wrong answer. But there's a whole range of right answers out there, and there's opportunity to learn in any of them. And so don't overthink and really get focused on, is this the right best thing that, uh, that I could do? So those would be, I think, the two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any other questions? I have one for General Zabel. Uh, I'm... <laughs> I'm really excited. Yeah. Hi. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, hi. You uh, did that. I had a question uh, really for everyone, uh, but I'll pick on Bobby first. Um, I'm revoking your I ever knew you card. <laughs> but I think uh, when, when you see more of these nation-state capabilities that are targeting 
regular corporations, industry, et cetera, does that push you into thinking that DOD needs to expand under their Defend the Nation umbrella and take on more of that mission space, perhaps from other organizations that may have it now? No. I mean, I, not to be so blunt. This that is not to say, no, it is not to say DOD doesn't have an incredibly important role, right? right? DOD has an incredibly important role. But if you look at uh, having now lived in the Defense Department and in the civilian side of government um, in this space and worked with industry, um, it will only work if we work together. Right? It will only work if we work together. And so I think the real question is one of how do we accelerate industry, particularly uh, tools for small and medium businesses, because that's really the, the most difficult of the problems. But how do we accelerate their ability to be more defensible? How do we leverage incredibly rich capability in industry? And how do we have the Defense Department be available um, and uh, when needed in certain sets of circumstances? And most importantly, how do we do this in a way that is in comportment with our ethos, culture, and what we believe is important as a nation? And that is not an easy problem, uh, but it is a very real problem. Um, we've tried for 10 years, as far as I can tell, to say we need a strict and clear command and control from you know, the president to, 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 and we didn't pick who those people were, but it needs to be one and it needs to be straight down. And we've tried that a few times, and it's not been an effective model because there are a range of concerns and considerations. And we also need to recognize that our relationship with the private sector and our relationship with the American public is not yet effectively defined. When, when I ask you what role do you want your government to play, you will have a different answer than General Shea, who will have a different answer than Carla, who will have, right? This is an unresolved question for us as a nation, and we must resolve it, and we must not get weighed down in roles and responsibilities discussions while we're solving that very important question. I guess I would say, um, so I would not lead with such an emphatic no. I think that there's <laughs> definitely a um, increase of role needed in very particularly in information sharing, in uh, permeability of information from the uh, um, in industrial side, the commercial side, um, to the military and back. That's absolutely got to increase. But there's also this community of people out there who are, um, they're on both sides already. Uh, they're reservists, guards persons, who uh, most of their time is that they have a, a normal civilian job, but they also are part of the, um, the, the DOD's um, cyber you know, security uh, response force. And I don't think that we've um, adequately employed them or let them know uh, where they need to be. Now, I do think that industry has great, uh, great skills in, um, in cyber defense. Um, I, you know, especially the ones who know they have been attacked for a while, such as the financial industry. Um, absolutely fantastic um, skills, and I would like to see some of their knowledge coming into DOD um, as much as some of our knowledge uh, going to them. So, like I said, I, I'm not sure that it... My, my no would be kind of... I mean, I think those maybe... Are, I think those are tools we have today. Yeah, I, we may not employ them correctly. I don't think, yes, I don't think we employ them effectively. Yeah, so I, so I agree. I mean, I'd like to see a lot of you know, further development there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we need to employ those tools more effectively. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Diana, any thoughts on that? <laughs> I agree with both of these very intelligent <laughs> women. <laughs> that we need to employ our tools more effectively. 